Hi everyone, this is the content lecture for early Christian art. For early Christian art, what I primarily want us to think about is syncretism. This is a term that describes the assimilation of imagery from other traditions, and this is very important in early Christian art um, because these artists, they're not creating anything new, particularly for this Christian religion. Rather, they're taking elements of earlier traditions and changing the meaning for the new context. And so what we're doing is trying to figure out how this artworm tra artwork transforms its meaning from pagan to Christian. A great example of this is this sculpture of the Good Shepherd. So it's very early in our Christian period. This is from the second half of the third century. This is a relatively small marble sculpture. It's only about 20 inches tall. And um, if you look at it, you have Christ here um, in the toga robe of a shepherd. And he's holding a sheep across his shoulders on, and resting his hand on its legs. There's little sheep at his feet looking up at him, and because it's a marble sculpture, it has to have um, support so that his arm won't fall off. All of this um, should look pretty familiar to us from Greek sculpture, but there's actually elements that are even more familiar. So here I'm comparing it to an archaic Greek calf bearer, and if you notice, it's pretty much the same pose with the animal over his shoulders, and um, his hands resting here, except for our archaic calf bear is bringing this calf for a uh, sacrifice. And so it's really interesting to look at this early sculpture on the left and think about the way that it is incorporating pre-existing styles but completely changing the meaning. However, what's important also about the Good Shepherd on the left is if you don't know the context, this doesn't necessarily seem Christian. Right? It could just be a shepherd with a sheep on his back. Or maybe he's going to make a pagan sculpt sacrifice. We don't really know unless you know this is a Christian sculpture. And part of how we know that is the way it was discovered. It was discovered in the 1960s in Turkey as part of a much larger sculptural group. And based on the subject matter of all of them, they were able to determine that this is supposed to be Christ the Good Shepherd. So we will return to some of these, but what's depicted is the story of Jonah, um, and, and this Jonah is from the Old Testament, and Christians like to point to stories in the Old Testament as predicting Christ's coming, and that's definitely the way Jonah is interpreted. However, we'll talk more about that later. Now we're going to look at some of the funerary art associated with Christian practice in the early Christian period. We're looking at a map of Rome right now, and what's important to understand about the early Christian period is that they were not allowed to be buried within the city limits. Custom said that Christians had to be buried outside the city walls. And so what Christians would do is they would purchase property and create their tombs within those spaces, usually with lots of other Christians. And what that basically means is in Rome, all of the earliest Christian art is a far away from like the Colosseum and the Arch of Constantine. St. Peter's is all the way over here. Um, and if you look at in this map, you've got like different catacombs. That These catacombs are where the Christians were buried. The catacombs uh, became a vast subterranean network of galleries and cubicula uh, that were designed to be cemeteries for Christian dead. And within these uh, cubicula, there are lo locally, these are small openings cut into walls uh, here to receive the bodies of the dead. Christians believe that when Christ comes again to earth, he's going to raise all of their bodies. And so it becomes important not to cremate their bodies, but rather to bury them. Um, it's also important they don't have the same belief in the full life after death like the Etruscans did either. However, we will see that the way they're decorating their funerary spaces are definitely influenced by Etruscan and Roman models. So here's the interior of a cubiculum for a fairly wealthy family, and if you notice, it is completely painted with frescoes. Um, this should be familiar because it's exactly what the Etruscans were doing. They were decorating the interior spaces of their tombs uh, to dissolve the walls of the subterranean uh, tombs and make it feel much brighter. 
That's exactly what the Christians are doing. We are going to look closely at the ceiling painting in this cubiculum within the catacomb of Saints Peter and Marcellinus. So looking up, we are looking at the ceiling and it's divided up um, into different sections. In the very center you have this uh, circle with a figure of Christ as the Good Shepherd inside it and then um, around the edges are all the story of Jonah and part of how we are able to interpret this is because of those that sculptural group that we talked about before. In this slide um, I have all of the different areas identified um, and this is another example of typology. So what is depicted here is a scene from the Old Testament story of Jonah. The story of Jonah is that God told him to go to the city of Nineveh and tell the people there to repent of their sinful ways and turn back to God. Jonah didn't like Nineveh and decided he didn't want to go there and so instead he gets on a boat and goes in the opposite direction but then God sends a storm and Jonah knows that he has to go overboard or else everybody's gonna die and so that's what we see here him jumping overboard and then when he goes overboard he is swallowed by a great sea monster and so here he is um, being swallowed the sea monster is ready to get him eventually the sea monster spits him out onto the shore and he relaxes under the shade of a tree and so there he is relaxing. Uh, in between these scenes are orant figures. Uh, their arms are outstretched in prayer and with all of this stuff without the context it's pretty hard to know that this is Christian because those orant figures are the same exact figures that worshipped in pagan spaces too. There's nothing explicitly Christian about them. In terms of the style of this ceiling, it's really interesting how they have very different styles for these figures up here than they do for these portraits in the corners. These portraits might represent some of the deceased, and they look remarkably naturalistic, much more like what we were looking at in Pompeii, if you recall. So if you compare the images on the ceiling of the cubiculum that we were just looking at, they're very, very similar to these sculptural groups. And it shows that there is an iconograph iconographic tradition already in process within Christian art at, at this point. So you can compare these. You've got an orant figure. You have Jonah reclining under a tree. You have him getting being swallowed by the sea monster and then being spit out. And then here's our Christ as a good shepherd again. But what's interesting is, we so we looked at a pagan um, reference for this good shepherd. There's also a pagan reference for our reclining Jonah. He looks an awful lot like the Barberini fawn, right? This Hellenistic sculpture uh, of a drunk uh, fawn reclining. And so again, you see this transformation of pagan imagery to ha now have an explicitly Christian meaning. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit with uh, Constantine in Imperial Rome, but here are some more specifics. Before Constantine, Christians are persecuted within the Roman Empire, often violently. However, in the year 312, Constantine beats Maxentius, and he attributes this victory to the aid of the Christian God. And so he ends the, the persecution of Christians, and in the year 325, he declares Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. This leads to a rapid decline of paganism and just an entire transformation of religious life in Europe. So what we're looking at now is a sarcophagus from after that point. So at in the year 359, Christianity is the state religion, and so if you want to be involved in the state, you should probably be Christian. So you have lots and lots of people converting to Christianity, including Junius Bassus, the person buried here. So he was basically the mayor of Rome. He's a very elite person, and this was originally in Old St. Peter's, the most important church in Christendom. And you see here a huge transformation in the, the quality and expense and luxury of artwork related to Christian practice. 
because if before they were being buried in outside the city walls in cubicula, now they can be buried in elaborate marble sarcophagi with sculptural reliefs uh, spanning the space. This thing is quite large. It's eight feet long, almost four feet tall just to give you a sense of scale. And again, I can't emphasize enough. You see now that Christian art, Christian is, Christians are the most important people now in the Roman Empire, and they need visual culture to, to reflect that. So, some things remain the same though. The subject matter here reflects the same interest in typology that we talked about in the Good Shepherd earlier. Here is a slide with all of the subject matter, and you notice that there's elements from both the New Testament and the Old Testament. So here, we, in the very center, we have Christ enthroned between Peter and Paul. Peter and Paul are two important saints for the city of Rome. Both of them were, uh, were executed there, and so Romans really see them as being their patron saints. And Peter, of course, was the first bishop of Rome, which makes him the first pope. Um, down here you have Jesus entering Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. This is the week before he gets executed, uh, crucified on the cross. Uh, so you've got major New Testament stories in the center. Um, this is the arrest of Peter here. And then um, Pontius Pilate uh, washing his hands after condemning Christ. Christ being led to Pontius Pilate for judgment. Uh, the captive Paul being led to his martyrdom. So the prominence of Paul and Peter definitely relates to the Roman context. However, you also have Old Testament figures. Abraham sacrificing Isaac, Adam and Eve, the suffering of Job, Daniel in the lion's den. These are all stories from the Old Testament that Christians try to relate directly to Christ as a way of demonstrating his authority and that he trying to prove that he's definitely the Messiah. Let's talk about this stylistically. We know it's Christian now because of the subject matter. It's more explicitly Christian. Like the uh, Adam and Eve, it would be pretty hard to think of this as being anything else. Um, Daniel and the lion's den, all of these things are recognizably Christian. Um, the style of it, though, is certainly very much indebted to Roman art of the Constantine era. So if you look at these figures, you can definitely see... Um, bodies underneath fabric, but they're that stubby, short body like we saw on the Arch of Constantine. So if you compare the bodies here with what we see on the sarcophagus of Junius Bassus, it's very, very similar. Okay, so one more thing, thinking about architecture. This is a small church called Santa Costanza, and it was originally uh, where Constantine's daughter uh, Constantina, or Costanza in Italian, was buried, and her sarcophagus is back here. It's this giant purple porphyry sarcophagus, so that same material that the tetrarchs used um, is being used for her sarcophagus. Um, but I want to talk about the architecture of this space. Um, so this is what's known as a centrally planned building because it's all equal parts around a central axis. You can see that here in the plan. Um, it also has an ambulatory. This is for walking around um, uh, the center area. Um, this, uh, like I said, this is originally where Santa Costanza was buried, and uh, this type of building is often associated with burial practices, which makes sense because that round shape, it should remind us of the tumuli that the Etruscans used. So these round burial mounds are still, that shape still resonates for people and is still being used for the sites where martyred saints were buried. If you look at the interior of the ambulatory in Santa Costanza, the ceiling is covered in mosaics, really elaborate, beautiful mosaics. And this, again, is a luxury material. Um, and it makes sense because this is the daughter of Constantine. Um, the subject matter here is very interesting, though. Again, not explicitly Christian. If you look, um, you've got all these funny little figures making wine. This guy's bringing uh, grapes to be pressed into wine. Very similar to what you have on the side of Junius Bassus's uh, sarcophagus. Um, all of these 
figures, they don't necessarily look Christian, right? But you could say that maybe it's marginally related to Christianity because of uh, the fact that Christians use wine in one of the worship rituals called communion in which they uh, remember Jesus' last supper by drinking bread and wine. And so maybe it's related to that. Or maybe this is just popular imagery that people still like and they still want to incorporate within their visual art. Anyway, as we move forward into the Byzantine period, we will see that this stuff becomes far more codified and the ambiguity that we see here uh, just melts away when Christianity becomes fully the, the state religion of all of Europe.